California's AB5 law has been copied by other states and uh, Joe Biden has endorsed it. But the law has really messed things up for freelancers and gig workers in California. It's, it's cut their economic legs out from under them right when more flexibility to make a living, not less, is needed in this coronavirus crisis and shutdown. So I think that uh, it's pretty clear, at least to me and many of my associates, that AB5 is bad policy. But here's a more explosive question. Is this law in California to be copied elsewhere? Is this law also unconstitutional? We'll explore this question in today's Lighthouse Briefing from the Independent Institute. I'm Graham Walker. I'm the Executive Director of the Independent Institute, coming to you from Oakland, California. Uh, we are situated right across the bay from San Francisco uh, and are pleased to be able to bring cutting edge public policy analysis to many of the issues of the day in a hopefully bipartisan and uh, evidence-based manner. Um, this is the ninth call that we've offered uh, this season to the members of our Lighthouse Society. <clears throat> we've also allowed other friends around the country to join us. Um, so pleased to have everybody with us who stands with us supporting our work. We're very grateful for that. Uh, our work does depend upon the support of uh, citizens who care. Uh, and of course, if you're interested in standing with us further, uh, you can always go to our webpage, independent.org, and toward the top right, there's a button called Donate Now. We encourage you to use that, obviously. But we thank you so much for being part of our team. And of course, we welcome all those who will join us in this recording subsequently. We give our Lighthouse members first crack at this kind of information. So um, as I said, this is the 10th briefing call in this series. Uh, this is a little different angle from what we've been doing. Um, it's necessitated by the fact that the Independent Institute has recently filed an amicus brief with the Federal Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal, having to do with this AB5 law. Um, let me just remind you um, that the, the bill um, is supposed to be helping workers, but actually harms them, restricts their flexibility, uh, and cuts the legs out from under uh, the independent freelancers, as I said. Um, last month, the Independent Institute submitted an open letter to suspend AB5 to Governor Newsom and the state legislature. Um, 153 California PhD economists and political scientists signed the letter, and it's been getting a lot of, of press. Um, of course, uh, you can see the uh, letter to suspend AB5 at our website, independent.org forward slash uh, uh, suspend AB5. And there you can see that issue plus today's issue on the amicus brief as well. Now, the legislature and the governor of California uh, could rescind AB5 or suspend it. Um, but as I asked at the top, the real question that we're facing today is whether the law is really intrinsically uh, mistaken on a constitutional basis. And so today we are joined um, by two uh, friends and associates of mine, uh, Crystal Swensbow and Frank Chang. Thanks, Crystal, Frank. So glad you're with us. Um, and uh, Crystal Swensbow and Frank Chang uh, are uh, constitutional attorneys and associates at the law firm Wiley Ryan LLP based in Washington, DC. And they're coming to us from the East Coast today. And they're ready to discuss with us the impact of this case and some of the reasoning in the amicus brief, which they have crafted for the Independent Institute. So let me just start with Crystal and say thank you for being with us, Crystal. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's great to have you. Also, Frank, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Good to be here. Okay, so um, maybe starting with Crystal, um, what's this case all about uh, that the amicus brief uh, is directed at and Who's suing the state for what? You know, give us the basics. <laughs> of course. Uh, so this is actually one of several cases that have been filed. It is a group of journalists and freelance writers. They filed suit against the state of California to enjoin AB5, largely related to the exemption provisions that deal with freelance journalists, <clears throat> editors, video and photo journalists. So in this suit, the um, plaintiffs and now the appellants have sought to suspend AB5 as it applies to them. They were denied in the district court and they appealed to the Ninth Circuit, which is where we are now. Uh, give us the formal name of the case. Sure, the American Journal Society of Journalists and Authors Inc. and National Press Photographers Association Appellants versus Xavier Becerra, the Attorney General of California as the appellee. Right. And if you want the case number 20 slash 55408 Ninth Circuit. <laughs> exactly, for your Lexus Nexus searches. Um, well, you know, the, the title of the case tells us a couple of important things. First of all, uh, a lot of the coverage about AB5 um, 
focuses on Uber and Lyft drivers. Um, but actually, this, uh, the law affects a much broader range of people and harms a much broader range. And in this case, we're looking for specifically at uh, journalists, authors, and photojournalists, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yeah. And, and so um, it, it's intriguing that that, that group, uh, of course, has uh, a lot more clout in the public, uh, public square, and they're the ones who have formulated uh, this case. They don't like the way their businesses have been undercut by AB5. So um, to support them, uh, Frank, what are some of the key like, high points before we get into the details? What are the key high points that you have put in this amicus brief uh, showing why the law may not pass constitutional muster? Just to briefly kind of lay the foundation. So as Crystal noted, this lawsuit has been brought on behalf of uh, freelance writers and photographers. So they are taking a First Amendment angle in their lawsuit. Uh, so what the Institute has done uh, coming in as an amicus in support of the freelance journalists and writers and photographers uh, is to paint a broader picture for the court uh, that's just not limited to the First Amendment angle, but looking at the broader uh, economic consequences and the arbitrary exemptions that are being drawn uh, broadly as a whole and uh, look at examining how the legislature's stated purpose is actually defeated by its own design. And finally, uh, the amicus brief also uh, provides a critique of how federal courts currently enforce and protect uh, the economic guarantees that are in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. So uh, the fact that their case is primarily being posed on First Amendment grounds meant that there was a need to address the broader uh, principles, right, Crystal? Because after all, um, you know, as concerned citizens and certainly as a research organization, the Inst Independent Institute, uh, we would like them to win their case. I mean, you know, more power to them. Um, but we Absolutely. care about their case. We care about their case because it addresses a broader range of issues. Um, just clarify a little more. Why didn't we just like support their First Amendment claim and just keep our mouth shut about the rest? <laughs> can you address that? Chris? Well, we certainly did support their First Amendment claim. Yep, right. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. I can. Uh, we certainly did support their First Amendment claim. So one thing we wanted to do as an amicus brief in this case was to give the court a little bit diff more to think about. So the, re the First Amendment case has a higher level of scrutiny that the court applies. It's known as strict scrutiny. It's a very close analysis that's done by the court. Mm -hmm. So we came in and said that, you know, first of all, you should under strict scrutiny, find this law unconstitutional. But even if you were to look at a lower standard of review, this rational basis review, as you'll see if you read the brief, mm -hmm. we would find that the law is unconstitutional even under that lower standard. And that lower standard um, obviously gives us a lot more to talk about in terms of economic liberties, something the Independent Institute is obviously very familiar with. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, when uh, a case is lodged based upon, say, the right to free speech, as the, the journalists understandably are, are presenting, uh, you're telling us basically that courts pay higher mm -hmm. attention, they give more scrutiny to that claim of the deprivation of liberty than to some other claims. Is that typically right? That is correct. There are, I, I hate to say it, there are the tier, we have a tiered system of rights, as it were, right. at least that's how the Constitution's been interpreted. That's right. um, rights like the First Amendment right to speech, uh, right against, you know, to avoid search and seizure, those tend to be uh, rights that are analyzed a bit more carefully by the courts. Uh, there's a kind of middle tier uh, rights, Second Amendment tends to fall into that group, mm -hmm. as well as um, <clears throat> equal protection claims based upon age. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have kind of this lower tier where you get a, a lower tier of scrutiny, this rational basis review. Uh, and that tends to be for economic liberties, uh, laws that discriminate based upon not special categories. Mm -hmm. So a special category like race or age is something that receives heightened scrutiny, where mm -hmm. something that distinguishes um, between equal groups um, you know, that are merely in a different economic state is considered, um, I guess, less uh, foundational in some aspects, which is kind of odd to say, but the courts typically apply a lower level scrutiny and the government is not put to as much of a test in defending its statutes. Right. I mean, a lot of, you know, ordinary citizens don't realize that uh, 
individual rights as articulated in the U.S. Constitution, which I have my pocket copy of here, um, <laughs> they can uh, be abridged or infringed by federal or state governments, but uh, because there are, you know, circumstances requiring it, but um, it has to be a strong justification for doing so. So that's the nature of a right is that it's not that nothing ever, ever can allow it to be infringed. It's that it's very important and there has to be a really, really good reason. So there's kind of, as you said, these tiers of justification. Um, I get why free speech is kind of in the top tier. Um, what you focused on, I think, in the middle portion of the brief, and again, I mm -hmm. encourage our friends uh, to take a peek at the, uh, the brief. It's really very nicely written. You seem to be focusing on um, the portion of the 14th Amendment. I'm just looking at it here in my, my copy, which says that states shall not deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor to deny to any person within the jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. So um, AB5 basically restricts freelance gig law. That sounds kind of equal to me, but what's not equal about it? Either of you can address that. Sure, I, I can address that. So um, I think if, if, if a person was to just sit down and read the various exemptions that are listed in AB5, they're going to end up being very confused because mm -hmm. they're not drawn in any kind of rational way. And so just to point out, a certain mm -hmm. industries and certain jobs and certain tasks are exempt, uh, while a, a very similar task will not be exempt. So that means the independent contractor status would preserve for one subset of workers while it's not preserved for another subset of workers. And that's where the equal protection guarantees come in. So the equal protection clause basically mandates the state governments to treat similarly situated individuals the same. And if they're going to treat them in a different manner, mm -hmm. uh, the state has to have a justification for doing that. And in this case, we highlight the fact that the state does, through AB5, treat similarly situated workers very differently and that they lack any justification for doing so. Right, and that is against that provision of the 14th Amendment. So yeah, I got exactly. it. So I was noticing, uh, Crystal, I, I was looking at some of the details in your brief and you can probably elaborate on this. My own little list indicated that um, according to uh, AB5, local moving services are exempt, but local delivery services are not exempt. Um, and errand referral services like TaskRabbit are exempt, but um, pickup and delivery by Instacart is not exempt. And MD anesthesiologists are exempt, but nurse anesthetists are not exempt. And graphic designers are exempt, but photojournalists are not exempt. Photojournalists being one of the yeah. litigants, uh, appellants in this case. <clears throat> photojournalists are not exempt, even though graphic designers are. So, um, Crystal, did the state legislature think there was a bright line distinguishing these groups, or what was the deal? It's unclear what exactly they were thinking when they did this. Um, so we've seen a couple of different notes from um, the assemblywoman who was the sponsor for the bill. She noted even um, one of the exemptions in the bill, there's a 35, uh, 35 submission limit uh, before a, a freelance writer flips from an, a, an independent contractor to an employee. The assemblywoman who sponsored the bill noted that this line was arbitrary. Oh. So, I can't say that I can divine, you know, divine some kind of bright line difference. Um, it looks, at least kind of on the surface, that these, that these different exemptions were made, perhaps for some political reasons. And frankly, it may have been moving uh, individual, uh, you know, individual companies or businesses' own interests forward. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem as if there is a rational and reason for these distinctions and as there really isn't one, it, the law shouldn't be upheld. Um, yeah, that word rational is key, isn't it? Because it um, is. if there's a rational explanation or a rational relationship of means to end, sometimes these infringements on liberty can be justified in courts, mm -hmm. but it's really hard to see in this case. I mean, you know, I look at the list of who's in and who's out, it kind of looks to me like the people with a little more political clout, the ones who are at the top of the pile, they get to keep you know, their businesses and keep building them, but the people who are at the middle or the bottom of the pile, they're not gonna be able to build their businesses up to the top uh, because they're gonna face these restrictions. I, I know a lot of musicians and writers are just up yeah. in arms about this. People who usually are not great advocates of the economic liberty agenda, they're suddenly realizing that with a law like this, they can't, you know, 
all their clients are going to have to like cut way back because otherwise they're mm -hmm. going to fall afoul of the law, the, the law and their clients are going to get punished by the state of California. It's terrible. And especially right now when people in California need more flexibility uh, to make a living uh, under lockdown and so forth rather than less. Time is moving on. Let me just move to this first question I've got from Terry. Uh, he says, uh, how do you see the well-publicized influence of the unions and their desire to unionize the gig workers? Um, and how is the unionization process actually affected by AB5? You may not be able to address this directly. Crystal, what do you think? Mm -hmm. So again, it's not something that I'm quite as familiar with, but we do know from a number of different news reports that the unions were very much in favor of AB5. And they were quite involved in some of the negotiations as well as some of the new exemption negotiations. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, once you are an employee, there is an option for to be part of a union. So it makes sense for a union to want more potential members. Uh, and so making more employees to become potential members is a positive for them. Yeah, I'm afraid that makes sense. You know, this is one of the, the issues uh, that really explains why um, the expertise of the Independent Institute was relevant uh, for the Ninth Circuit Court to hear from, because we do have a lot of research and studies and scholars who have done studies on the impact of uh, workplace restrictions on unemployment and so forth. Um, the more workers are protected, the more unemployment there is typically. Um, and some of our research really bears on that. And, and it addresses the question, is there a rational basis, a rational relationship between the means and the intended ends of this legislation? Mm -hmm. And so with your help, uh, we're weighing in. Uh, and I think the answer is probably no, probably <laughs> no. Uh, oh, here's another nice question from one of our uh, participants <laughs> right now. Uh, uh, what drew you to this quest? <laughs> well, the excellent clients, obviously. Um, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say we were approached um, by some mutual friends and to see if we would be interested in writing on this topic. Frank was actually the person who kind of made the connection. So Frank, I, I don't know if you want to say more about it, but we were, of course, thrilled to write on such an important topic, especially in a First Amendment case. You don't often get the chance to tie in the economic liberty side for an important First Amendment issue. So it was a real kind of boon for us. And then obviously the Independent Institute has some phenomenal scholars and you'll see there's an extensive bibliography um, in which we were able to draw to get the, um, the more nuanced information, um, even in the short time we had to write the brief. Yeah, check, check out that bibliography, it's really good. Uh, so yeah. uh, Crystal was uh, a clerk on the Sixth Circuit Federal Court of Appeals, mm -hmm. and she has done appellate work before the US Supreme Court on significant First Amendment issues, so you cared about this kind of thing. Um, Frank has been on the uh, staff of the Senate Judiciary Committee, he was a clerk on the federal Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, so I think there's a lot of good reason to be happy that the Independent Institute has such good legal assistance and we're grateful for that um, very much. So okay, so I have a couple other questions here that I got in written form. Uh, and let me remind our, again, our participants, uh, you can submit your questions using that Q&A function. You can raise your hand, which is the best of all, because I like to hear your voices. So. Uh, I can see some of my friends on there. I'd love to hear from Bob. Hey, you're on there, Bob. I'd love to hear from Bill. <laughs> Just looking at my list of participants. Raise your hand. I'll open up your mic. Uh, so, okay. Uh, here's another question. Um, what other cases have been filed challenging AB5? Right? Yeah, I mean, so the most obvious one, uh, the, I guess the most popular one, most well-known one is the lawsuit brought by Uber drivers and Uber and uh, Postmates. And it, the case is called the Olson versus California. And they are uh, taking a broader route than just the First Amendment route. They are bringing claims that are based on their you know, due process uh, rights. Uh, Ninth Amendment claims are in included in there, which is very interesting. They're raising claims under the contracts clause of the Constitution. So they're taking a multifaceted approach to AB5 as a whole, as opposed to the freelance, freelance journalism provision that's at issue in our case. Right. Um, and, you know, just by way of clarification, um, our work uh, with this case and the amicus brief uh, and the work from our attorneys uh, at Wiley Ryan is not in any way funded um, by those commercial litigants, although we wish them well, uh, for sure. You know, the funny thing is uh, the... Um, Uber and uh, Postmates and so forth, they're focusing on their aims. The journalists are focusing on their aims. 
we're really here because we have a sense of the public interest um, that's at stake. Um, I would think, I think it'd be great if many of these groups could manage to, you know, wangle an exception, an exemption for themselves. You know, there's a bad law hurts everybody. The more people can be exempted, the better. But the reason that you guys framed the case uh, in our amicus brief mm -hmm. as broadly as you did is because the aim is not simply to get one little group or one other little group, you know, exempted from a bad law. Let's see if we can undermine the bad law on a much more uh, broad basis to help everybody. I mean, wh why should we want anybody to be uh, harmed by a bad law? Uh, so exactly. we're great. Yeah, we're grateful for that. So, um, Crystal, here's another question I've got here. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens? Um, how will the Ninth Circuit likely rule in this case? I don't think you can really answer that question, but that not really. Not? The typical lawyer answer is it depends. Yeah. Um, so the next couple of steps, uh, we filed uh, an amicus brief in favor of appellants. The appellees, the government, now have a chance to write an opposition brief. Then there will be a reply. So the case will be fully briefed by the middle of July, and then it will be assigned to a panel of the Ninth Circuit. So three judges, they will decide whether they want to hear oral argument or whether they will write a, an opinion on the papers alone. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, it could be an oral argument far into the future. Unfortunately, uh, because of COVID-19 and the coronavirus crisis, a lot of courts are putting off oral arguments so that they, or they're doing it via, you know, Zoom Gov, any one of these mm -hmm. video conference hearing types. Um, but the Ninth Circuit, unless we get a very friendly panel who really wants to rule in favor of economic liberty quickly, uh, it's entirely likely it may take a year to get a decision. So wow. while we hope that they rule in favor of you know, the journalists, Uber, any mm. of the freelance workers, it very well might depend on the panel um, and what issues they kind of get to first. There are a couple of these cases percolating at the same time. They might put off deciding our case to look at the Uber case first or vice right. versa. Right, they might well. And you know, um, simultaneously and in the meanwhile, as I understand it, some of the original sponsors of the legislation uh, in the California legislature are working on some proposed legislation which would modify, amend, mm -hmm. adjust, or fix AB5. <laughs> but the fixes uh, in question seem have to have largely to do with just carving out a few more ex exceptions uh, for politically influential groups. And I suppose my fear is, and you can probably comment on this as attorneys, my fear is that if the legislature in the meanwhile were to give exemptions to some of the groups that are unhappy about it, uh, let's say they give them to, you know, the Uber and Postmates people, or they give them to the photojournalists, and then their cases become moot in the court because the legislation is no longer, you know, uh, in force. Uh, the case goes away, but then the broad-based solution can't really be achieved. Am I right to be worried about that, or am I on the wrong track? So yes and no. Uh, mootness is definitely a tool that the government could use to get rid of some of these cases. But because the cases as a whole present such large industries, I mean, Uber, Postmates, that case in and of itself has a number of different facets that a yeah. single exemption or a more narrow exemption won't necessarily fix. And same for the photojournalists, the video, the videographers, writers, and editors. Mm -hmm. A single kind of fix for those individuals may not necessarily get rid of all of their claims. Plus the fact that AB5 has been in existence and limiting people's work for the last few months means that harm has already been incurred. So we will be able to look at at least the harm that has taken place, even if it stops at some point based upon a new law or exemption. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, here's another question I just gotten from one of our participants. Mm -hmm. Are there any groups that could come under AB5 if it passes legal challenge that these groups are not aware of? In other words, could there be more damage done to some groups who don't realize that they're going to be caught in the AB5 net? I, I think the, a good way to look at it is that every worker, every freelance worker is presumptively under this law now, unless yeah, one yeah. of those few exception, exemptions apply. Um, and so that could, mean, that could affect millions of people in California. And the California legislature itself has admitted that hundreds of thousands of people will lose their jobs. So this is going to definitely affect everyone who is not listed on those exemptions lists, and they should probably uh, look into that. 
Yeah, I think people need to be aware. It's one of the reasons we're trying to raise awareness of this issue, both through our other work and also this amicus brief. People need to know what the issues are and that the stakes are high and that everybody's economic liberty uh, could be affected. You know, I can't help thinking back. Uh, I'm a political scientist more than I am a whole legal person, but I can't help thinking back to the enactment of uh, the Obamacare legislation some years back. Um, it cast a very wide net uh, and a lot of people were upset that they were going to be caught in it. And so there were some really important negotiations went on. Different states, different groups sought exemptions from the Obamacare. And I remember there was some horse trading that went on. Wasn't, wasn't the state of Nebraska, didn't they get uh, kind of a, a pass from out, out from under Obamacare and then in return for it, there was a, a vote given. I forget which, which state it was really, but I know there was some horse trading going on. So you kind of wonder, man, oh man, uh, why does this always have to happen? And I think the answer is that when governments, uh, bureaucratic organizations decide that it's their role to spread a wide net of control, then people try and get out from under it. And you know, some people are pretty selfish. They, if I got my exemption, I don't care if anybody else is messed up by this law. How much better if we all band together for what is really in the public interest uh, in, in a, common, a common good way? Okay, here's another question. Um, Anyone who uses Uber or Lyft knows how the worker uses their employment to gain flexibility in their work. Is there any move from within the employees to actually vote against AB5 if it came to unionization? Again, you may not know, and I'm not sure I do. Do you? Mm. I'm not sure about unionization, but I know there have been a number of Uber drivers or these kind of on-demand workers who have banded together. And I believe they actually passed, had a petition this last week to put AB5 on the ballot in November. Mm -hmm. So they've been very active in opposing it kind of on the ground level or the grassroots level. Yeah, I mean, it's not surprising because so many people have found ways to earn extra income through these kind of gig opportunities. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone's focused on Uber and Lyft because it's just familiar and there's a lot of people involved in it, but it, it's not just Uber and Lyft, it's an Uber and Lyft plus many, many other professions. And also in California, um, it is true that in the state legislature, a uh, preponderance of Democratic representatives you know, are favored and still favor AB5, and again, Republicans tend to oppose it. But the reality is, you know, among ordinary people, not elected officials, um, everybody has a bipartisan hatred of AB5 um, <laughs> because it hurts so many people. And the fact that you've got, you know, you guys are supporting with, uh, for our, with us, you guys are supporting the journalists and, and so forth and the photographers, the creative you know, type of people. Um, it just illustrates how widespread is the anxiety about AB5 and how much importance there is in, in getting out from under it. So yeah, um, I think just to, just to add to that, I think uh, one of the uh, highlighting factors is, is COVID-19, I think. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people losing their jobs right now, can't go to work. And sometimes these freelance or gig opportunities used to be ways for work, ways for people to work from home. So one example that we do cite in our, in our amicus brief is uh, a company called Rev. And it is a, a freelance tr uh, audio transcribing service. Okay. So they would, they would uh, get people to, you know, you know, be their independent contractor and, and, people would work from home, listen to the audios, and they would transcribe it and turn it in. Um, that company has announced that it, it will no longer hire people from California because of AB5. Oh, man. And yeah, and this would have been a perfect opportunity for some people who are quarantined at home and have some free time to earn an extra I'll say. You know, book or two. But now Rev has you know, categorically said they're not going to hire people from California. So this is one of the ways in which it, this is hurting people during quarantine. Yeah, man, it sure is. It just it limits people's options in a very harmful way. Yeah. So back to the thing about, um, we're going to close up here shortly, but back to the thing about uh, the different categories of people affected and our, our claim, your claim, that this is a violation of the 14th Amendment's uh, equal protection claim. Um, there's different professional categories that are handled differently. But beyond that, and I don't know if this is legally relevant, it seems relevant to me that it affects people differently depending upon their sort of economic and class setting. It seems very clear that the restrictions are much tighter on the middle class and lower income people than they are on upper income professional type people. Is that a relevant equal protection concern? 
say I'll let Frank chime in on this as well, but yes, I think so. So economic kind of station or low, middle or high, you know, kind of top class in terms of income is not a protected category, but I think it says something about the, uh, the motives behind the bill when you have folks like lawyers and architects and doctors who are exempted from AB5, yeah, but wow. individuals who work with referral services like DoorDash mm -hmm. or freelance journalists who have, again, this is a typical freelance job, who are caught within its coffers. So you've got a real distinction between both. Okay. AB5 is supposed to help the middle class, but instead its strictures are being imposed on the middle class and low income groups more heavily. Right. Yeah, I think that's right. And if you look at some of the jobs that are exempted, I mean, these are jobs like doctors, lawyers, mm -hmm. you know, all, all of these people who, you know, on a typical day make more than an Uber driver or others. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, this AB5 does come hard on people who are in the middle income and low income categories. What really bothers me about it is that those people at the higher echelons and in the professional categories that are exempted, they can keep on making money, um, but mm -hmm. in the name of quote unquote protecting workers at the bottom and the middle, there are going to be fewer jobs and fewer employment earning opportunities for the people who need it most. Uh, and I think it's really important to see that point in, in this larger context. Um, very often uh, legislation like this, which is allegedly helping uh, workers is actually harming them. And what it really helps is creating an opportunity to, to organize and unionize a whole new category of workers who have up to this point been resistant to it. Um, AB5 is just a proving ground for that kind of tactic, and it's really regrettable. So um, I think that we are nearly at the end of our time here. Um, one more thing, let me just thank you uh, for your good work, and thank you especially for the way that not only uh, the two of you framed the uh, equal protection argument, but also the way that you gave a new focus to how federal courts, including the US Supreme Court, um, have not given sufficient scrutiny to the infringement of economic liberty. Um, isn't that a little bit of an unusual angle that you put in our brief compared to some others? We think so. Uh, rational basis is a test that's been around for a while, but really it's allowed a lot of courts to rubber stamp government, government projects that should not have been approved in the first place. And that's something the Supreme Court has noted, you know, sometimes in dissent, um, the Ninth Circuit has at times overturned laws because they were irrational, but that shouldn't be the exception. That should be something every court looks at when it is approached and asked to review a law for constitutional, for the constitutional basis. Yeah, you, you mentioned in one of your phrases in the brief was that it seems like rational basis review has become a kind of toothless review uh, yes. And economic liberty is very important. It deserves more than a toothless review. And I suspect, now I can say this because I'm not an attorney, but I suspect, I'm not predicting, but I suspect that some of the judges on the Ninth Circuit will see in, in this case, maybe with your assistance through this amicus brief, um, that the case presents an opportunity to address a much broader set of issues, a much a broader uh, infringement of economic liberties and give economic liberties more protection than they have given been given under the standard rational review, a rational basis review. And I'm grateful for the way that you gave us a very potent and well-framed and broad amicus brief. Thank you to Crystal Swensbo and to Frank Chang. We wish you the best and thank you for your help. Well, thank you for having us. It's been a pleasure. It's great yeah. to have you too, Frank. Yeah, uh, thank you for having us. You're most welcome. So uh, let me just say goodbye to our friends. Um, remind you uh, that you can go to the Independent Institute website, uh, independent.org forward slash suspend AB5. You can see the stuff on AB5 generally, including a link to the amicus brief that we've been discussing and an article uh, penned uh, by Crystal and Frank in support of the amicus brief. Also, we very much appreciate your financial support, especially during this uncertain time. Uh, keep standing with us, friends, and thank you for all you do for the Independent Institute. Goodbye from Oakland, California, and best wishes. Stay safe to all of you. Mm -hmm.